Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Shui Meng Plant by Song Ling Pu from the 17th century book Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio. We'll be reading this story as translated and edited by Herbert Allen Giles and published in 1916. If you've been around for a while, you already know that these stories are pretty strange and this one is stranger than most. We also know that Giles really loves to add comments in the footnotes, and they are not always helpful or even necessarily relevant. In this case, because the footnotes are simply tangents, I opted to add them into the story itself as parenthetical comments, slightly tweaking the sentences in order to fit them in. Let's see how that goes. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. The shui mang plant is a poisonous herb. It is a creeper, like the bean, and has a similar red flower. Those who eat of it die and become shui mang devils, tradition asserting that such devils are unable to be born again unless they can find someone else who has also eaten of this poison to take their place. These Shui Mang devils abound in the province of Hunan, where, by the way, the phrase same year man is applied to those born in the same year instead of to people who graduated school at the same time. These same year men exchange visits and call each other brother, their children addressing the father's brother as uncle. This has now become a regular custom there. A young man named Chu was on his way to visit a same-year friend of his when he was overtaken by a violent thirst. Suddenly he came upon an old woman sitting by the roadside under a shed and distributing tea gratis. Incidentally, this is by no means an uncommon form of charity. During the temporary distress at Canton in the summer of 1877, large tubs of gruel were to be seen standing at convenient points, ready for any poor person who might wish to stay his hunger. It is thus, and by similar acts of benevolence, such as building bridges, repairing roads, etc., that the wealthy Chinese person strives to maintain an advantageous balance in his record of good and evil. Chu immediately walked up to the old woman to get a drink. She invited him into the shed and presented him with a bowl of tea in a very cordial spirit, but the smell of it did not seem like the smell of ordinary tea, and he would not drink it, rising up to go away. The old woman stopped him and called out, San Yang, bring out some good tea. Immediately, a young girl came from behind the shed, carrying in her hands a pot of tea. She was about fourteen or fifteen years old, and of very fascinating appearance, with glittering rings and bracelets on her fingers and arms. As Chu received the cup from her, his reason fled, and, drinking down the tea she gave him, the flavor of which was unlike any other kind, he proceeded to ask for more. Then, watching for a moment when the old woman's back was turned, he seized her wrist and drew a ring from her finger. The girl blushed and smiled, and Chu, more and more inflamed, asked her where she lived. "'Come again this evening,' replied she, "'and you'll find me here.' Chu begged for a handful of her tea, which he stowed away with the ring, and took his leave. Arriving at his destination, he felt a pain in his heart, which he at once attributed to the tea, telling his friend what had occurred. "'Alas, you are undone!' cried the other. They were Shui Mang devils. My father died in the same way, and we were unable to save him. There is no help for you. Chu was terribly frightened, and produced the handful of tea, which his friend at once pronounced to be the leaves of the Shui Mang plant. He then showed him the ring, and told him what the girl had said, whereupon his friend, after some reflection, said, She must be San Niang, of the Kou family. How could you know her name? asked Chu, hearing his friend use the same words as the old woman. Oh, replied he, there was a nice-looking girl of that name who died some years ago from eating of the same herb. She is doubtless the girl you saw. Here someone observed that if the person so entrapped by a devil only knew its name and could procure an old pair of its shoes, he might save himself by boiling them in water and drinking the liquor as medicine. 
Chu's friend thereupon rushed off at once to the cow family and implored them to give him an old pair of their daughter's shoes, but they, not wishing to prevent their daughter from finding a substitute in Chu, flatly refused his request. So he went back in anger and told Chu, who ground his teeth with rage, saying, If I die, she shall not obtain her transmigration thereby. His friend then sent him home, and just as he reached the door, he fell down dead. Chu's mother wept bitterly over his corpse, which was, in due course, interred, and he left behind one little boy, barely a year old. His wife did not remain a widow, but in six months married again and went away, putting Chu's son under the care of his grandmother, who was quite unequal to any toil, and did nothing but weep morning and night. One day she was carrying her grandson about in her arms, crying bitterly all the time, when suddenly in walked Chu. His mother, much alarmed, brushed away her tears and asked him what it meant. Mother, replied he, down in the realms below I heard you weeping. I am therefore come to tend you. Although a departed spirit, I have a wife who is likewise come to share your toil. Therefore do not grieve. His mother inquired who his wife was, to which he replied, when the cow family sat still and left me to my fate, I was greatly incensed against them, and after my death I sought after San Niang, not knowing where she was. I have recently seen my old same year friend, and he told me where she was. She had come to life again in the person of the baby daughter of a high official named Jen, but I went thither and dragged her spirit back. She is now my wife, and we get on extremely well together." A very pretty and well-dressed young lady here entered, and made obeisance to Chu's mother, Chu saying, This is San Yang of the Kao family. Although not a living being, Mrs. Chu at once took a great fancy to her. Chu sent her off to help in the work of the house, and, in spite of not being accustomed to this sort of thing, she was so obedient to her mother-in-law as to excite the compassion of all. The two then took up their quarters in Chu's old apartments, and there they continued to remain. Meanwhile, San Niang asked Chu's mother to let the Kao family know, and this she did, notwithstanding some objections raised by her son. Mr. and Mrs. Kao were much astonished at the news, and, ordering their carriage, proceeded at once to Chu's house. There they found their daughter, and parents and child fell into each other's arms. San Niang entreated them to dry their tears, but her mother, noticing the poverty of Chu's household, was unable to restrain her feelings. "'We are already spirits,' cried San Niang. "'What matters poverty to us? Besides, I am very well treated here, and am altogether as happy as I can be.' They then asked her who the old woman was, to which she replied, "'Her name was Ni.' She was mortified at being too ugly to entrap people herself, and got me to assist her. She has now been born again at a soy shop in the city. Then, looking at her husband, she added, Come, since you are the son-in-law, pay the proper respect to my father and mother, or what shall I think of you? Chu made his obeisance, and San Niang went into the kitchen to get food ready for them, at which her mother became very melancholy and went away home, whence she sent a couple of maid servants, a hundred ounces of silver, and rolls of cloth and silk, besides making occasional presents of food and wine, so that Chu's mother lived in comparative comfort. San Niang also went from time to time to see her parents, but would never stay very long, pleading that she was wanted at home and such excuses. And if the old people attempted to keep her, she simply went off by herself. Her father built a nice house for Chu with all kinds of luxuries in it, but Chu never once entered his father-in-law's door. Subsequently, a man of the village, who had eaten Shui Mang and had died in consequence, came back to life, to the great astonishment of everybody. However, Chu explained it, saying, I brought him back to life. He was the victim of a man named Li Chu, but I drove off Li's spirit when it came to make the other take his place. Chu's mother then asked her son why he did not get a substitute for himself, to which he replied, I do not like to do this. 
I am anxious to put an end to, rather than take advantage of, such a system. Besides, I am very happy waiting on you, and have no wish to be born again. From that time, all persons who had poisoned themselves with Shri Mang were in the habit of feasting Chu and obtaining his assistance in their trouble. But in ten years' time, his mother died, and he and his wife gave themselves up to sorrow and would see no one, bidding their little boy put on mourning, beat his breast, and perform the proper ceremonies. Two years after Chu had buried his mother, his son married the granddaughter of a high official named Jen. This gentleman had had a daughter by a concubine who had died when only a few months old, and now, hearing the strange story of Chen's wife, he came to call on her and arrange the marriage. He then gave his granddaughter to Chu's son, and a free intercourse was maintained between the two families. However, one day Chu said to his son, "'Because I have been of service to my generation, God has appointed me keeper of the dragons.' and I am now about to proceed to my post. Thereupon four horses appeared in the courtyard, drawing a carriage with yellow hangings, the flanks of the horses being covered with scale-like trappings. Husband and wife came forth in full dress and took their seats, and, while son and daughter-in-law were weeping their adieus, disappeared from view. That very day, the Cao family saw their daughter arrive, and, bidding them farewell, she told them the same story. The old people would have kept her, but she said, My husband is already on his way, and, leaving the house, parted from them forever. Chu's son was named Nyo, and his literary name was Li Chen. He begged San Niang's bones from the Cao family and buried them by the side of his father's. The best sentence in this story is, We are already spirits, cried San Yang. What matters poverty to us? Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. Firstly, just to get it out of the way, Giles refers in a footnote to the, quote, temporary unpleasantness in Canton in 1877, end quote. I'm not sure what he's talking about and I haven't been able to find any troubles that he's specifically referring to. So it doesn't seem to be a major historic event, and I think you would have to actually read his autobiographical book about his travels in the region to figure out what specifically he's referring to, if that's where you want to go. I want to mention the fascinating concept that if you know a devil's name and you make a brew by boiling their shoes, you can protect yourself from their evil influence. And then the parents want their daughter to be resurrected so they won't give up the shoes. What a completely bizarre bit of magical thinking. Who came up with that superstition? But apparently there are actually a lot of superstitions all over the world about how shoes are connected to the spirit of a person. Perhaps because everybody back in the day was wearing leather shoes and over time they really take on the imprint of the foot that wears them. There's also a bit of it follows in this story, right? Where people who are afflicted have to pass on their affliction in order to escape it. So it goes on and on and on and on. And Chu here is so lovely, using his ghost powers to go down into the afterlife and putting spirits in their right bodies or whatever he's doing and trying to end this unfair system. The Shri Mang plant is probably Elysium anisatum, the Japanese star anise. It is highly toxic. It's used as a pesticide and it's used to repel animals, and it is used in a few topical medications. It also apparently has a lovely fragrance and can be burned as incense, and it protects graveyards from animal predation. In Japan, the plant is considered sacred in Buddhism and is called the sacred anise tree. Japanese star anise causes nausea, hallucinations, epileptic seizures, and ultimately can cause respiratory paralysis and death. Fascinatingly, it is an incredibly close relative of Elysium verum, Chinese star anise, the star anise that we use in our kitchens all the time. Side by side, the two living plants are incredibly similar, and you can only really tell them apart using botanical microscopy to identify the few specific chemical compounds that differentiate those two plants. 
Once they are dried and processed into tea, however, the only way to tell them apart is with a DNA test. This means that there are periodic outbreaks due to contamination of Chinese star anise teas and powders with deadly Japanese star anise. In 2001, 63 people in the Netherlands were sickened by a tea blend that contained trace amounts of Japanese anise. 22 of them went to the hospital with epileptic seizures. Isn't that fascinating? I did try briefly to see if I could find any Japanese myths and legends about this plant, but nothing leapt out at me, almost certainly because I'm searching in the wrong language. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that I'm not exactly sure which order this little batch of stories will go out, but I am certain that by the time you are hearing this story, I will be in Italy! Italy! That country made me rethink my whole career and life and everything in the U.S. I'm serious, it was a huge revelation. I was having lunch on a little side street in Verona, and everybody else was having lunch, and the little shops closed for a couple of hours in the middle of the day so that people who worked there could eat and walk their dogs, and, and it really kind of rang out in my mind that there are things in life that are more important than work. I had spent, I don't know how many years, having like 20 minute lunches at my desk and always being available at any time to anybody. And just seriously, it makes me sad to think of how many evenings and entire weekends I just spent literally laying flat, staring at a screen, waiting for the hours to pass until I had to go back to work. What a terrible way to live your life. Anyway. This is a slightly belated birthday trip, and I will be going for a couple of weeks with my mom, who has never been. I'm recording a bunch of stories ahead of time, and I'm being a bit smarter about it than I was last month, so hopefully that'll work out better. I really do want to have a proper holiday, so I might not even bring my laptop with me. If you are ready for a proper holiday, you should subscribe to the channel. Every week I scour weird old books for stories that are interesting and unusual, and you can just relax and listen to them. Please also help other people find the channel by liking this video or dropping me a comment below. Thank you so much for your support, and I will see you in a few days.